really happy to see you all here. I think this is an issue that it's easy to kind of mobilize it around it when it happens, um, and then it fly off the radar over coming months. Um, I'm not sure many of us remember there were actually laws passed against the knitting nanas a couple of years ago, specifically targeted targeting their lock-on actions. That sort of had a bit of a flash in the pan response, and then haven't been challenged since, and those still remain on the books and they were called repressive at the time but now you no longer hear anything about them. So I very much hope that these protest laws we will see a sustained campaign against, against what has become a real restriction um, in the space we have for political protests in New South Wales. This isn't an isolated thing that's happening with these laws. This is part of a very long history of response to the increasingly intense environmental protests that we've seen and an increasing state fear of anything that's disruptive. So I wanna, I'm wanna i going to kind of awkwardly look at my laptop a little bit because I'm not great at speaking off the cuff and I think this issue des deserves a bit of you know, quite carefully worded consideration. So forgive me for doing a little bit of reading. Um, I wanna kind of take us back a little bit to what might be, seem like an unlikely time and place, the steps of the Opera House in 1990. So on the steps of the Opera House in 1990 is Nelson Mandela, who is newly released from prison. And he's speaking to a crowd of tens of thousands of people about the long fight to end apartheid. And he talks about the storming of the Springbrook cricket ground and protests of the all-white South African team. He mentions other healthy and militant, in his words, actions that gave him and those resisting apartheid in South Africa a heart. And he pays special mention to the Seamans Union of Australia over the preceding decades had refused to unload ships bearing South African cargo and worked to prevent their entry into port, stopping the functions of ports effectively during this time. The militant action of workers in Australia and all over the world put real pressure on the apartheid regime and as we all know played no small part in its eventual collapse. Woo! <laughs> yeah, woo, very much so. Israel next! Yeah, <laughs> I second that motion, thank you. Um, and the really interesting part of the story for us is that today the kind of action the Seamans Union took would likely see them subject to the charges of up to two years in jail for disrupting the operation of the port under the new laws passed by the New South Wales Parliament in March. So a key thing I want to explore a little bit in my talk is the idea of disruption. We've seen the word disruption thrown around a lot in legislative debates about the new laws, and it's often used as a distinguishing factor of what makes a protest lawful or peaceful. In the picture that's emerged from political rhetoric, disruption is this great red mark. Once your protest is disruptive, it's an unfair imposition on others and therefore unlawful. And I want to unpack this a bit. As a community, we're very ready to celebrate collective action when it leads to wins like the end of apartheid or women's vote, voting rights or the eight-hour workday. But we sometimes forget that getting those challenges was actually a battle and one where the biggest power of ordinary pe people is their capacity to disrupt business as usual and make those that carry legislative and political power pay attention. This is why the capacity to engage in specifically disruptive protest is essential, because the very as essence of protest is capacity to make business as usual stop and create pressure for something to change. If the Siemens Union have chosen to, mar to march alongside the ships bearing South African cargo with anti-apartheid placards, who knows where the fight against apartheid will be today. But because they chose to disrupt the economic lifeblood of the apartheid regime, their actions got real results. We understand this when it comes to international sanctions. The call to impose heavy and debilitating economic sanctions on the Russian state when it attacked Ukraine was almost unanimous. This power to exercise pressure does not lie solely with states. It lies with the collective populace, with us. We widely accept that workers have a right to strike and put pressure on bosses to provide safe working conditions and sufficient wages. In fact, many of the things we consider part of the Australian way, whatever the merits of that are, are things won by collective pressure from workers. Eight-hour workdays, weekends, and social security all come from very disruptive union action. So we accept as a community that disruption to business as usual through collective action is sometimes justified as a means of exercising our collective power for social change. So in this context, let's ask, what is the impact of this crackdown on disruptive collective action? We've made a protest that might block traffic for 10 minutes, punishable by two years in prison. We've made a protest that even causes a pedestrian to be redirected, punishable by two years in prison. 
What does this mean for us as citizens who might want to exercise collective power when the normal means of representative democracy fail to deliver action on existential threats like climate change, or even to deliver things like a living wage? The environment that this creates is a very, very chilly one. None of us want to think about going to prison if we exercise our collective rights to demonstrate. But under a new laws, a protest that veers outside the very specific conditions set out in a Form 1 will be in danger of being caught by the new charges. If you take a different street to the one specified on your route, sit down on the road when you didn't specify that you would do so, participate in a union, union action relating to social justice rather than an industrial issue, like the actions against apartheid, the new laws might apply to you. Even if you get more people than you were expecting at a rally and you cause pedestrians to be redirected when entering town hall, the new laws might apply to you. We're already seeing police proactively using the laws to constrain the way people protest at town hall. The problem with trying to draw a line between lawful and unlawful protest is that the more you corral lawful protest into the most respectable, least disruptive corner, the easier that line becomes to cross for any of us participating even in protests that most of us would consider quote unquote respectable. If we're going to have a functional democracy, we have to protect the space for collective power. And that means vigilant, uh, being vigilant about attempts to divide democracy and to divide protests into lawful and unlawful, to divide good, respectable protesters from bad and scary ones. Because when it comes down to it, the question is not whether the Se what the Siemens Union did was disruptive or caused inconvenience. The question is how effectively it addressed a historical injustice and helped to put it to an end. So on a practical note, I guess we have to ask ourselves, what is it that we can do to stand up against this? So I want to pay special mention to the MUA here, the Maritime Union of Australia, who are of course the people who have carried on the Seaman Union's mantle in Sydney, um, who participated with Legal Observers New South Wales and others in an action breaking the new laws on May Day, um, walking up from the MUA headquarters to Town Hall. Um, I think continued disruptive action is part of this, continuing to talk about the new laws, continuing to call out police overreach when it comes to protest more, more broadly. I think we have to be very vigilant about attempts to say, well, this kind of police action against this kind of protest is, is justified because it could come for us all. Um, just today, and I think I can mention this because there's been a media press conference, um, there was a property where some protesters were staying, some protesters associated with Blockade Australia, there was a police raid with over 100 police for about 30 people. Just want to let that sink in. Um, detaining all the people on that property without necessarily, we haven't heard an excuse as to what the basis for the search warrant was, um, why a dog squad was involved, why several helicopters were involved. I mean, this should make us all very afraid, I think, without being, you know, without being, uh, without overstating the issue. 100 police for 30 people, I mean, it's the kind of things you see to address terrorists, not people engaging in protest. So calling out things like that, being very vigilant about when the state starts to say, well, these are bad protesters, they're not like us, you know, they're not going to exercise their rights in a way that's non-disruptive, therefore they deserve the full power of the New South Wales police state brought upon them. Let's call that out, you know, let's call bullshit um, and let's make it acceptable to say that disruptive action is part of our democracy, it's a part of what makes us who we are, and it's a part of what protects our freedom and our capacity to exist in the future. So, thank you. <laughs> Linda Lovechild. Yes. That's still the name of that speaker. Linda Lovechild. And Linda Lovechild is, the, is the performance artist. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Performance artist. Performance artist. Thank you. Um, this, um, this song I wrote in June 2021, and it's de dedicated to Carolyn Tyler down the end there. <laughs> yes, you. Um, because she told me that she was at a gay rights uh, um, um, demonstration, taking photographs, and they tried to arrest her. And she, was, she said she was just taking photographs. And so she got away with it, which was great. Anyway, now this is, I wrote song parodies. So this is called The Protest is Picnic, and it's based on the tune to Teddy Bear's Picnic. And um, I've performed this a few times, and I've done that. Okay. Does everyone know the tune? It's in your head. Okay. <laughs> 
If you go down to a demo today and take your football with you, just say you're exercising your rights when collared by boys in blue. And if a policeman happens to ask, remind him that you're wearing a mask, today's a day to get out and get loud for justice. Whether it's for the environment, or refugees, or Julian Assange, or just free speech, point our placards to the sky. Let's all practice what we preach. Let's stand up for human rights. You know, you've got the right to, or take it on the chin. <laughs> for the scarf around your neck, sacred as a crucifix. If you go down to the streets today, take all your friends with you. You're, the right to protest is yours and mine. Watch out for the thin blue line. As long as you're wearing your 40 shorts, you can get away with all sorts of rorts. Today's a day to get out and get loud for justice. Whether it's for the environment, or refugees, or Julian Assange, or just free speech. Point your placards to the sky. Let's all practice what we preach. Let's stand up for human rights. You know that you've got the right or take it on the chin. Put a scarf around your neck, sacred as a crucifix. If you go down to a demo today, then take all your friends with you. To say you're exercising your rights when coloured by boys in blue. And if a cop takes off his badge, you'll get a beating very bad. You better run or you wind up dead. No justice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, I will begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land which we're beating the uh, Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Um, pay respect to their elders, past, present and emerging, and I do note that their lands were never ceded. Um, thank you. I really loved Anastasia's speech, and um, what I'm going to say is going to take a slightly different angle. Uh, Anastasia um, spoke in defence of the right to protest disruptively. Certainly disruptive protest is one of the um, uh, historically uh, known types of protests. It's not the only type of protest. There are plenty of protests which are aimed much more at um, uh, gaining support in a wider audience for an issue, bringing an issue to public attention, um, and uh, building a community of support. Disruptive protests are a particular species of protest within the wider protest movement. What I want to start on is though the legal, the, the government reaction to the latest examples of disruptive protest and how that reaction oversteps the mark. By criminalising to the extent that they have, causing serious dis disruption on um, bridges, tunnels and main roads, as well as a whole lot of infrastructure facilities, 41 selected railway stations um, and other uh, infrastructure, that is a um, unjustifiable overreaction to the protest actions that we've seen. Um, firstly, um, it is the first time in New South Wales, first time I can find uh, anywhere that the criminalised act is causing serious disruption. There is certainly criminalisation of causing damage to property. Um, there is... Uh, um, the, the only example of causing uh, serious disruption in the criminal law is in terrorism offences, where the motivation is for a political outcome. And quite how they distinguish the offence which they've created 
um, which is um, disruptive protest um, from acts of terrorism is very, very unclear. It's very dangerous um, to um, do what they've done, which um, could be, could easily uh, be seen as uh, the same laws could have been brought in as counter-terrorism laws. Um, and uh, I think that that's a very dangerous aspect of it. Um, I think we're in unknown territory when uh, it comes to what acts cause serious disruption. Um, we know that protests traditionally cause disruption and or can cause disruption and protests which the courts have approved um, cause have caused disruption. So uh, Stephen kindly mentioned the first protest matter that I was involved with, acting for Ian Rintoul, when he organised, in a stroke of absolute creative genius, a protest outside the private house of the then Minister for Immigration in 2003, Philip Ruddock. And Philip Ruddock's private house was located on a road in West Pennant Hills, and that road just happened to be the only entrance into quite a large area of sporting fields. And um, by having a protest on that road outside Philip Ruddock's house, all the kids playing soccer and other sporting games on the morning of that protest weren't able to get to their games. That caused serious disruption. The question before the court was, is that justifiable protest? Is it reasonable for um, a protester, uh, firstly, to invade the privacy of a politician by protesting, having a protest outside their private house, um, and obviously affecting members of the politician's family, but is it also um, justifiable to uh, cause disruption to people engaging in traditional Australian activities like sporting events? Fortunately, in that case, we had a judge who just happened to be, um, some years earlier, a president of the New South Wales Council for Civil Liberties, and she um, managed to find uh, in favour of uh, Ian Rintoul and the protest uh, proceeded. So we've got an example, um, admittedly 20 years ago, of disruptive protest being upheld against the objections of the police. Since then, unfortunately, a lot of the cases have gone the other way. Um, a protest, for example, um, which was going to be on Oxford Street against the Israeli Film Festival, um, perhaps not a very well-conceived protest because the Israeli Film Festival was mostly um, comprised of pro-Palestinian films. Um, but there was to be a protest outside the cinema on Oxford Street, the police objected to it because closing Oxford Street or even half of Oxford Street for a protest would be too disruptive. Um, and uh, the police couched it not just in terms of disruptiveness, but they couched it in terms of public safety. The closing half of Oxford Street um, for a protest would have implications for public safety. And the, the expression public safety got the attention of the court and the court um, prohibited um, that protest. So um, let's pose a situation where there is disruptive protest that doesn't cause any uh, risk to public safety. And there I think we would have um, a protest which could quite well be justifiable um, and uh, uh, justifiable within the implied constitutional freedom of free speech, um, but would fall foul of these laws. And so anybody here who's organising protests, that's the objective, to try and pick the difference between um, a protest which would not come within the implied constitutional freedom and one that still falls foul 
of these laws. And then we've got a vehicle um, to take the case to the High Court. I think Anastasia was telling me earlier that there is already a case being planned for the High Court to challenge these laws. Um, that would be just fantastic. From a lawyer's point of view, that's really what this game is all about, testing the authorities in the courts. Um, all very well to be out on the streets, but it's better to get the authorities into the courts and argue um, the case and demonstrate when they're depriving us of our human rights uh, to protest. That's what they're doing. Um, I think another interesting aspect um, of these laws is that there is a review in two years. Um, and I think that's different from the lock-on protest laws where there's no uh, baked-in review. I think one of the conditions that Labor uh, managed to achieve um, in what was otherwise a disgraceful um, agreement by Labor to pass these laws once the government agreed to exclude industrial campaigns and industrial elections from their scope. Um, uh, I think a lot of attention should be put by people involved in this issue into arguing the case in the review in two years' time as to why these laws should not continue. And uh, you know, obviously we'll have a new government um, uh, at that time. Um, impossible to say what the makeup of that government will be, but given Labor's track record on this law, um, one can't be confident that there is going to be um, a majority uh, political support for doing away with these laws. We really, I mean, I think that's another uh, area that people can focus on, and that is um, to focus on Labor's failure to protect wider community values, to focus only on the interests of the unions and the industrial campaigners and their right to cause disruption, and to ignore the rest of the community's rights is reprehensible. Yeah. Labor had the opportunity to block this, and it failed. Shame, indeed. Um, so look, I think those are the comments which um, I'd like to make. Oh, sorry, I'll, I'll mention one other thing. There's a parallel um, attempt by the UK government to bring in um, what's been called the Public Order Bill in the UK. It failed, or aspects of it failed uh, at the end of last year, but there's another attempt this year uh, by the Boris Johnson government to um, bring in uh, some public order measures. Some of them are quite familiar to us in New South Wales, the lock-on um, uh, prohibitions and so forth. Um, there is a report by the UK um, uh, House Committee due out on Tuesday, UK time, um, on that bill. I expect that report will um, set out all of the arguments for um, maintaining uh, the right to public protest um, unimpeded by um, police, uh, the need for police approval. I'm sorry, I will we'll mention just one other aspect with the new laws in New South Wales, which is um, unsatisfactory and paradoxical. We've always had in New South Wales for the last 50 years under the Summary Defences Act, the right to protest you put your Form 1 into the police and provided you've done it seven days in advance, you're authorised to have your protest. If the police want to prohibit it, it's the police that have to go to the court to get an order prohibiting it. And that's um, been a really excellent uh, balancing of, of the rights or the preservation of the right to protest. Under the new laws that passed in April, um, it's an exemption to the um, causing serious disruption uh, prohibition uh, if the protest is approved by the police or authorised by the police. Now, I understand from talking to some protest organisers that in the practical world, the police are interpreting that as meaning if the Form 1 has been submitted, then they will take that as having been authorised by the police. But that's not the way the law is written. 
and it's quite unsatisfactory because the way the, the rules in April were written, it requires police authorisation um, for the protest to be exempt. So we have a very awkward balance there. Um, at the very least, in two years' time, that inconsistency needs to be sorted out. Uh, um, open it up for discussion. I think we could have a really interesting conversation about that. Um, Just hang on, guys. Just let Pat speak, and we'll try to get the microphone fixed. Okay. So um, our broad community organisation is also um, we usually march on May Day because we support labour rights. Now this year May Day occurred, um, which is a big march of like um, five to ten thousand unionists through the city. This year it occurred just after this law had been passed, and the reason I'm saying this is because the unions in New South Wales, unions New South Wales, collectively and individually, actually did not support these laws and were not consulted by the Parliamentary Labor Party when they, the, the Labor Party in Parliament supported these laws. And I think that's a very important issue for us to keep working on because there is a division between the unions who do not support these laws and the Labor Party in Parliament. Now what happened with May Day was very interesting because the police, we wanted to have May Day, there was a lot of confusion about which venues were available. We wanted to have it in town for the square and um, initially the police said, oh the new laws mean you can't have it there because if it, if it spills out into the tram stop, it'll be disrupting transport infrastructure and you can't have it there. And the unions just said that, well look, whether, whether we can or not, there's going to be five to 10,000 people in Town Hall Square, so you'll just have to manage it. And of course, the protest went ahead, and there were thousands of people there. And we marched down George Street up to um, Hyde Park, um, Market Street, Hyde Park. So I'm, I'm just trying to say that I think there is some hope for, in practice, um, challenging these laws. And as you said, the MUA actually marched from their office through town or square. But the union movement is not, uh, does not support these laws and is prepared to say, no, we won't. Um, you know, we, we want to have the broad right to protest and um, uh, so they're not on the same page as the parliament and the Labour Party. So I just wanted, to, I suppose that's more a statement. Than that. Sorry. <coughs> uh, you might want to comment on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, thanks so much. Was it Pat? Yeah. yeah, thanks so much, Pat. Um, yeah, I think what you bring out there is really, really quite crucial about Labor's role in all of this and their relationship with unions. Um, what we saw in practice was that Labor was actually prepared to pass the laws um, without broad industrial action amendments and without the sunset, sorry, without the sunset, without the review clause. Um, and without kind of questioning them until the unions kind of made a last minute call to them and said, wait a second, what are you doing? Think about what you're doing. Um, and then we saw some of these broader amendments defining industrial action more broadly, having the review clause. And we saw uh, Labor asking some questions as well uh, in Parliament about the sort of uneven effect um, and about what unlawful means. And they actually tried to introduce an amendment saying these laws should not apply to, uh, I think, peaceful protests was the, was the words that they tried to use in their amendment. And of course the Liberals said, well, you know, these are all peaceful protests. We're actually, we actually are trying to criminalise peaceful protests, but we're saying that disruptive peaceful protests are not okay. So some of that, so the crucial role of the unions there is to force the kind of debate that if there is going to be a successful constitutional challenge, I think some of that debate will be very useful. 
um, and it's also created it created some division within the Labour Party as well. Like. It was really interesting watching the debates in the, especially in the upper house, once they'd had a bit of time to process and once the union pressure had been applied. Um, you know, you saw kind of some, some Labour members, I don't remember specifically who it was, but they was, sort of began asking like, oh, but wait a second, you know, what about unions taking action against things like apartheid or social justice? Um, so there's a bit of a division in the ranks, I think, with Labour that unions can and should exploit. Um, and of course, you know, the capacity of, of Labour to respond to any real workers' concerns is very much up for, up for debate. Um, but I think especially with the new Albanese government, there is space to continue wedging Labour on this um, and to not allow this kind of creep against protest rights more broadly. And on the, on the May Day question as well, um, yeah, as I mentioned in, in my sort of comments, uh, the laws are being used proactively by police to change the way that protest happens. So yeah, the light rail didn't end up being shut off. Um, during May Day, we were sort of, except for the bit where the march was proceeding through, so we were sort of corralled into that square um, between the town hall and St. Andrews. Um, and that happened for the school strike for climate as well. So that's the real danger of things like this, is then they're used by police to really control how, when, uh, and what, and how disruptively protests can happen. Um, and that's kind of the broad impacts that we maybe don't see at first blush. Can I ask a question myself? Uh, look, uh, we do a, a, a protest every week um, called Refugee Lives Matter, and the police have often been just a nuisance. They ask you about Form 1, I tell them they can, it's not, the Form 1 is not permission, we already have permission, this is just notification. Uh, but the, the, form, the form one is just a creeping, a creeping thing. That should, I should never have been introduced, in my opinion. Um, so, I, like the police, regard it as their business. And I'm always wrong, reminded of, you know, Red Square in 1968, where the, where several people came and protested against the invasion of Czechoslovakia, and they were hustled off into Black Mariahs and taken away. And I sort of get a feeling of that. I mean, it's early stages, but the police regard it as their business. If people, a handful of people, say five, are, are, are doing a peaceful protest at the, at the town hall, I just told them to nick off. Really, uh, I've I just become very irritated at them. Firstly, irritated at the indifference of the public. Secondly, in, in, uh, in, uh, angry at the uh, interest of the police. That's none of their business. So it's the wrong way around. The, the public should be interested, and the police shouldn't be. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's the reverse. So, like, what, what do we do to get, to get rid of the Form 1 baloney? And, and, the, and this, it's just a, a, it's a kind of a, a bureaucratic creep thing. They think it's permission. Thank you. Sorry. Well, uh, <laughs> um, as you probably gathered from uh, the remarks I made, I'm actually quite keen on the Form 1 arrangements because they represent the right to protest that is, you don't need permission by the police. You don't need any cooperation by the police to lodge a Form 1. You have the right to lodge a Form 1, provided you do it seven days in advance, then you are immune from prosecution um, from the two offences. Um, and uh, that, that's causing obstruction and um, unlawful assembly, whatever that might be. Um, and one would have thought that if you're immune from prosecution from uh, causing obstruction, then you should be, you should be immune from uh, causing serious disruption. Um, but of course, that's not written into the law, and that's one of the flaws, and Someone's got to take a case to the Supreme Court and uh, get the court to uh, really send a message to the Attorney General's Department that there are some drafting laws here that have to be addressed. Yeah, and just adding, I can just go without the microphone because it comes out to now. Um, just adding onto that and what um, you mentioned about the, uh, the inconsistency about police approvals, I think one really concerning thing that's happened with the legislative debates and the way the government has responded is that 
you not? Can everyone hear me when I speak like this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think I'll just keep doing this because the microphone's yeah, the thing. Um, yeah. So when inconsistencies like that have been pointed out, and the problem with you know the drafting obstruction doesn't actually mean disruption. You can't just say that it means disruption and be like, yeah, the form one system still continues to operate as it always has. The Attorney General's department has basically responded by saying, no, nothing has changed. Um, so there's this really concerning sort of thing of, you know, you've drafted a badly drafted law, very, very quickly drafted. I just want to remind everyone that it passed, it was conceived and passed within something like 72 hours, probably drafted within that time as well. Um, so, you know, it, it's concerning on a, on a broader level that the Attorney General's Department and the government more broadly is, is, is so content to leave so much legis legislative ambiguity um, and to say that because the, what we've said words mean certain things, that's what they mean. That's not actually how legislative drafting and legislative interpretation works. You have to actually put it in the law. Um, so, yeah, it's the broader thing. I can see that um, we should continue with disruptive demonstrations and it should go to court because the law is a crop. Um, that's the only way it's going to be tested. And with large demonstrations, obviously, they're going to cause disruption. Um, and my question for Gabriella is I didn't really know about. Um, uh, the case about the knitting nanas and why they weren't allowed to protest. I'd just like to know more detail about that. Um, yeah, I probably, maybe you might have more detail than I do because all, like, the, the extent to which I'm aware of it is that there were laws introduced to stop lock-ons onto, you know, mining and, and gas facilities um, or access to mining and gas facilities targeted at the knitting nanas. I think in 2019, um, but I actually, I don't, I'm not across the detail of the court. Do you know more about the actual provisions? No, I remember the provisions coming in, um, uh, but I, like you said, I, I've not seen any, any real um, commentary on how they're working. I don't know the number of people who've been charged on them. I don't know whether... Um, the knitting man has decided to cease that form of protest activity in response to the laws. Um, and, uh, yeah, it, there's, there's, sorry, as a, as a lawyer, I just find this all fascinating because there is so much opportunity to take uh, test cases. Uh, and, um, you know, after there, there was a challenge to the Tasmanian anti-forestry protest laws, which were really aimed at dis um, uh, protests which were disrupting forestry operations. And perhaps because of the particular way they were drafted, the High Court struck them down. And so we've got that as an authority. I suppose um, people might be um, afraid to take another test case to the High Court, partly because of the High Court that is currently constituted may be less sympathetic. And uh, secondly, uh, because you don't want to create a bad precedent in the High Court. You want to be there on um, pretty solid ground. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. But, but I, it's, a, it's a long time since I've spoken to any of the living nanas. I don't know whether they've lost their uh, enthusiasm for that kind of protest uh, because of the laws or because of some other reason. Um, and if the laws were abolished, whether they would resume that kind of protest. Um, and then, uh, look, I, I, I don't think you can ignore the political environment concerning climate change. And we do have a new government mm. Um, with different climate change policies. We have a New South Wales government which has got um, uh, more progressive climate change policies than were previously the case. Um, maybe some of the impetus for that kind of climate protest actions has dissipated. Although it's not stopping the blockade of Australia, of course. And nothing, 
no political addressing of the climate change issue is ever going to stop that group. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, so part of the climate change issue is that the Manner uh, laws and the Tasmanian anti-forestry laws is I think that they're an example of a more targeted kind of protest law that used to be more common. Um, and that the New South Wales government sort of seems to think that these new laws are more of the same, a kind of targeted response to a specific sort of protest action, but what they actually are is very broad, non-targeted legislative provision, which is why we've been able to create such a coalition around it, right? I think I want to really draw out the fact that there's an opportunity here, because the laws are so badly drafted, um, to bring together groups that don't traditionally talk to one another, who regard their protests as as different kinds of protests um, and don't feel that they have perhaps a, share, a shared cause in protecting a certain kind of political expression. So I think I would note that it seems we are moving into an era of a broader kind of anti-protest legislation and we're seeing that in the new Tasmanian anti-protest legislation too that's before, I think still before the Tasmanian uh, parliament at the moment, um, it's legislation that criminalises um, certain kinds of uh, Locking to industrial sites and forestry sites, um, and in fact, there are concerns that because of the way it's drafted, it could even impact people who are sleeping rough next to certain kinds of like facilities or offices. So the Council of Social Services in Tasmania has actually spoken out against these new laws. Um, so it's interesting, I think, that we're seeing that in both New South Wales and Tasmania, where governments are really broadening what they what they capture when they pass laws against protest, um, but I think that gives us incredible opportunity as well. Right. Yeah, good day, um, Brian Cronkatter. First, I'd just like to say, um, bring Julian Assange home. Elbow should do all he can to uh, bring a great Australian home, right? Get off your ass and do something, mate. Yeah, um, question. Um, this time last year, uh, we had the first um, COVID protest march in uh, Sydney, which I got arrested at. Um, I copped uh, three fines, uh, 1700 in total, $1,000 one, um, being outside the five, 500 offensive behaviour or something, 200 not wearing a mask. Um, they put the Israeli uh, torture cuffs on me, the thick rope ones that are like graphite. Every movement's like cut glass um, torture. Um, kept me there for about an hour. Anyway, um, they wrote out the three fines and um, I mentioned, um, have you got the legislation to do that? Because uh, I heard that um, federal law supersedes state law. You know, when it comes to the Nuremberg Code, you, you can't be forced to take an experimental uh, vaccine. Um, they still they wrote out the fines, um, but it, it, they never um, came through. I kept bringing up uh, state debt recovery. A few weeks later, I still haven't come through, still haven't come through, still haven't come through. Then I copped another 300 going in the Aldi's about uh, QR coding in. I copped another couple, uh, kept saying the same thing. Uh, state, uh, federal law supersedes. Um, can you tell me anything about that? And um, as well, I've protested a couple of times out um, Parliament House, and I, the police have just given me a move on direction, which I followed, and that, that was it. it was that basically, if you, as long as you follow direction, so does it stop you getting fines? Um. Oh, I'll take the, the second part first. And I think there's an exception in the new laws for protest outside uh, Parliament House and Macquarie Street. So, um, for some reason, you're allowed to seriously disrupt Macquarie Street um, as, as an exception. That's assuming Macquarie Street is a main road, which I guess it must be. Um, what, what, one of the difficulties of the, of the laws is trying to work out what is a main road. It was hard enough working... Well, uh, under the previous version, um, uh, before the April amendments, um, uh, seriously disrupting bridges, um, if designated bridges, uh, was an offence. Um, it just happened that the regulations prescribed every bridge in the Greater Sydney area, without exception, as a designated bridge, which must have been an invalid 
regulation. Um, it's a shame we, we don't have an opportunity to test that. Um, going back to the uh, first part of your question, the, the anti-COVID uh, offences, the, the uh, COVID protest offences, um, I think there's been an interesting chapter in New South Wales um, history, um, Capital for Civil Liberties, which of course I'm involved with, um, has been very supportive of the COVID restrictions and uh, have taken the position that they're justified in the public health ground. Um, yeah, uh, the, the COVID restrictions were justified on public health grounds. Um, there were, of course, some famous, uh, some famous protests during the COVID period, uh, Black Lives Matter uh, protest, which was approved by the Supreme Court uh, early in the, in the COVID era. Um, I, I think uh, what we saw in Victoria, very violent protests against the COVID restrictions, I think very hard to justify either the level of violence, well certainly you can't justify the level of violence of the protest activity. I'm not sure that you can even justify the protest activity against the laws. The laws were justified. Um, so that's the civil liberties uh, point of view. Um, and if you've managed not to actually have the fines um, registered against you, that's a bonus. Do federal laws supersede state? Um, they do, but I'm not sure that's uh, that goes to the issue. Is that a defence in court? Okay, thanks. Oh, can I make a comment about the COVID? Um, I think, yeah, I think the aspect um, of the COVID laws that I found interesting is this question of how are public safety concerns utilised to crack down on protests in a way that is not actually justifiable for a public health perspective. I think that um, protests in general during the COVID pandemic did not necessarily have to be an unsafe thing from a public health perspective. You know, all the protests that did happen um, uh, in, for example, in at Sydney Uni, um, and others uh, in front of New South Wales Parliament, there was a car convoy, they were all masked and socially distanced and still fell afoul of the restrictions. So we have to ask in times of crisis, how does the state use that to justify greater restrictions on freedoms than are necessary? Um, and of course there wasn't um, necessarily cases traced back to, to protest activity when it was undertaken in a COVID safe way. Um, so I think that we should be concerned about the fact that the COVID restrictions were misused by police. Like I, I spoke just then about the car convoy. So there was a, a nine person protest, each of them in individual cars, just driving past New South Wales Parliament to protest the fact that they'd all been laid off without leave at a local pool. Um, and that fell afoul of the COVID restrictions and they copped over $9,000 in fines. I, I mean, there's no public health way to justify that. That's just bad regulation making. Um, and I think the fact that we don't have a Bill of Rights in New South Wales is a huge part of that. Because in Victoria, you actually have to consider the human rights implications of what you're doing when you're making regulations like that. And we should be very careful with regulation making powers because they often fall outside of you know our capacity uh, to easily challenge them and there's huge discretion there. So it sort of gives us a bit of an impetus to think about that. What, how can we structurally set ourselves up so that it isn't as easy for the state to use things like COVID as an excuse to constrain political expression? Yeah, so who wants to answer the question? Who goes on with it? I've got one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, thanks. Uh, there was a lot said about the Form 1 or Schedule 1 thing, but I, I'm pretty sure that the people who hang off the bridge or in the tunnel don't put in a Form 1. So I think we should just talk a little bit more about that situation and whether this law is really justifiable even without that um, aspect of the Form 1 being involved. 
Well, I, I don't I'm think... Just ask maybe one more thing, because yeah, yeah, well, I know there's one person who's been like, sentenced to jail, and just if you could update us about her case, that would help, I think. Um, certainly, and I, I hope this is clear in the comments that I've made, I don't think these, um, these laws that were passed in April are justified. Um, I, they're, they're not good laws. Um, they, as Anastasia has said, they are a general application when the political purpose was to target a particular narrow group of protesters engaging in a particular kind of disruptive uh, protest. Um, I don't think there is wide community support for the right to engage in protest by hanging off the Sydney Harbour Bridge or um, by uh, closing down the Newcastle coal terminal or by closing down uh, Port Botany or as threatened on uh, Australian Rock Aid's website, having disruptive protests in Sydney CBD uh, for a week starting next weekend. Um, I think the lack of community support for that style of, of protest um, is not insignificant when considering what the law should provide. Anastasia is absolutely right. The law should be consistent with human rights, and human rights does have within it the right to free speech, and we have in Australia at least a very weak implied constitutional right of political communication. But I don't think either the constitutional right of in, uh, political communication or the um, human right to free speech encompasses activities like hanging off the Harbour Bridge, closing down Port Botany and so forth. And so I think one always has to recognise people may want to engage in that style of protest and people may want to support that style of protest, but it's always going to be uh, legitimate to criminalise it, it is a legitimate question to ask are the penalties that are imposed as a result of a criminal conviction um, proportionate to the seriousness of the crime? I think it's quite arguable that the level of penalties, two years imprisonment, $22,000 fines, on its own, that is a level of penalty which is disproportionate to the seriousness of the crime, particularly when the crime is carried out for a morally justifiable purpose, whether it is anti-apartheid, going back decades, or um, environmental uh, causes now. I think that's an area where you can have legitimate debate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um... I think the disruption question is a really interesting one and I don't necessarily think that I have a settled opinion on it, but I find it interesting to think about some of the kind of inconsistencies perhaps and how we think about disruption and I mentioned this in my comments earlier, but you know, when we look at um, something like a strike, um, it's necessarily a disruptive action, it's one that causes great inconvenience, even the most tame strikes, say like the New South Wales Teachers Federation strike in May, um, you know, parents are having to make alternative arrangements for their children, some are not able to go to work. The disruption that's caused is perhaps in a way even greater than sitting in traffic for 10 minutes extra than you would have had to. Um, but there isn't this same kind of panic about, you know, our community is being targeted by these terrorists um, in the same way that the response to Placate Australia is. And some of that, I think, comes from the fact that strikes emerge from a collective worker base, uh, which has greater legitimacy. You know, there's a fact that, you know, we know what teachers are fighting for. We all know teachers. We are serviced by teachers. Um, it's a bit easier to accept that kind of disruption. 
but on the level of the disruption itself, there is not necessarily this bright line uh, where we can say one type of disruption is absolutely justified and one is not. And I would note that a lot of the rhetoric that um, the government employs against unionists and people participating in strike action is very similar to that employed against Blockade Australia. I think that um, Perite, when the teacher strike was on, there was really strong condemnation of, you know, they're stopping people from working, you know, this is unacceptable, they're selfish, they're, um, you know, you had the, even the rail, uh, during the rail union strike, the government themselves closed down all the trains, despite the union saying that they continue working. I mean, huge disruption, right? The government aren't calling themselves terrorists as a result of that. So I just think it's, and I'm not necessarily drawing out one specific point here, but I just think it's interesting to think about when we see these condemnations of these people are stopping us from going about our lives, let's think about what is the political purpose of that kind of rhetoric and who is it aimed against and who does it ultimately serve. I don't know if my question is burdened, but I thought your response to that last uh, question really gets to the heart of the matter from a, an ethical or moral perspective. The question of proportionality of the action relative to the cause that has, caught, that has led people to take the street so I engage in the disruption. Um, I'm, I'm thinking in particular uh, is, of, of the question of uh, climate change. Uh, and although we may have a federal government now that's probably more sympathetic uh, to action in this area, policy action, I'm talking about not direct action, uh, uh, I, I think we can expect that they will continue to be quite hard on direct action. Uh, attempts to disrupt uh, contracts going to uh, export terminals I imagine will continue to be seen as an intolerable form of, of, of action. Um, yet it seems to me, in, in an ethical sense, that there's much more justification for that than the strike action, for example, or a disruption of public transport in pursuit of particular sexual interests, whether it's a, a particular union or, or, or even a broader class interest. Isn't there some sense in which the national interest, the global interest, the future of humankind uh, justifies more extreme actions and therefore less extreme penalties. Mm. Thanks so much for that. Yeah, and I think that, you know, we would all be very happy if the government saw it that way. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's a really interesting, I mean, yeah, when you get into, you get into these questions, I think, um, really quite interesting theoretical questions of how well is the law adapted to situations where we're facing existential crisis that might stop the society that is governed by that law from existing? Like, I think we're faced here with something that goes beyond what the legal system can absorb. Um, and it's really interesting, I think, that when you see these cases being challenged in court, judges often struggle with the sense that, well, yes, what you did, did was technically illegal, but they can see the broader moral, ethical purpose behind it. And often people do get off for, for that reason. Um, and it's, it's, it's a very strange tension for the legal system to confront because the law functions as a total system. Nothing is meant to actually exist beyond it when it's applied. But these cases bring in the social and bring in the political. Um, and I think we're increasingly seeing those fault lines in, in, with the new laws and the way they're applied. So I think it'll be very interesting um, and a very interesting question for any of us you know, in, the, in the legal profession. You know, how do we think about this? How do we think about the law as a social organism um, that does adapt um, as, political, as political things happen? Um, and I want to go back just briefly on, on the point of um, the extreme penalties. There was a question asked earlier that I didn't respond to about the people charged uh, in relation to recent protests and given custodial sentences. Um, so there was one person charged in, in November uh, in relation to the Newcastle disruption that was given a one-year um, sentence. Um, that was 
uh, eventually stri stricken out on appeal, and there was another person who was given a four-month custodial sentence that was thankfully also uh, struck out, but they really did have to fight, and there have been recent comments. There was an appeal on Thursday against inaction under the new protest laws, um, some of people given two-year community corrections orders, where the judge actually said in, in her comments, um, denying the appeal, that if she had been the magistrate, then those people would have gotten custodial sentences under the new laws. So this was people sitting on a road causing traffic to be disrupted by 20 minutes or so. If, if even that, I'm not even sure how long it was. So that, that should really give us pause, I think. I don't think we should get complacent just because nobody has gone to jail yet, um, because the way that we're going, it will happen. Um, and it's really up to all of us to stop that train from advancing. Well, first of all, we are not terrorists. And second of all, we're not going to stop protesting. And third of all, I have seen video footage of the police terrorising protests. Um, at the beginning of COVID, I saw a video of a 62-year-old professor at Sydney Uni having his feet kicked out underneath him by police and he fell to the ground. Um, I saw the Aboriginal protesters being corralled in Central Station um, in COVID times, corralled in a very tight spaces and being beat the shit out of. So, you know, they're breaking the law. Um, and I think eventually um, it'll have to just be, I think we just protest as normal and eventually it will be tested in the courts. Can I, can I make another, uh, say something else? Like, on the 4th of July, I go to court for, for um, sticking a piece of paper on the Macquarie statue. You've probably heard about it. Um, and this really, it's not talking about myself particularly, but it throws into relief just how little protection there is for really basic human rights in Australia. And what I might, is my nightmare, and I confidently predict this will happen, but I don't want it to happen. We should fight against it. We should absolutely use these three years to protect ourselves, human rights, with a, as you're saying, and Brian, um, with, with a, a Human Rights Act. We've got to use these three years. The government has shown it is not hitting the floor running at all. Look what it's done with, with, uh, with Julian Assange. Nothing. It echoed what uh, 30 years ago, um, um, what 30 years ago, what, what um, uh, Gareth Evans said, we don't use megaphone diplomacy or loud hailer diplomacy, as he put it, which means he just betray people. And we talk about, uh, about uh, uh, Albanese doing stuff behind the scenes. It means he's doing nothing. And, oh, and afterwards, when, when, when Julian Assange is deported, he'll say, oh, it wasn't that opinion. We did everything we could behind the scenes. No, it needs a public declaration of uh, a, a, a demand that he be immediately freed. A demand of the British government, of the Americans, and heard to say that by all of us. Anyway, but what, I forgot what I was going to say. Uh, but, but the thing is, on the 4th of July, that we, you can stick a piece of paper on a, on a, on a statue just saying, just saying what M Macquarie actually said in ordering the Appen massacre in 1816. Nothing else, not saying he's a, not insulting him, just quoting him. Um, and, and I could go to prison for two years, which would be a bit of a laugh, actually. But it might make things change because this, the trouble is that the, the reaction to what's happened to Julian Assange has been very, very sluggish. And it's not been just because of the media. It's because people are not, do not have a culture of human rights um, or what rights might be. They think, oh, they don't like Assange very much. They don't like, what, they don't like the picture that um, Four Corners painted of him, which was grossly misleading. So they don't like him, so he can stay in prison as long as, as, long as you like. I mean, it's all wrong. The thinking of the public is not right. The thinking of all of us is not right. And it's, it's brought on by propaganda. It's brought on by a lack of culture of human rights. And we really have to change it in three years. Otherwise, the Liberals will get back in. And you'll have, we may not have Dutton. You'll have someone like Dutton who will do a minority war. And just like Dutton did it left, right, and centre, picking on minorities. It's like, where's the next minority? It was horrific. Not if you're not if you're white and middle class. It's not too bad. You don't need to worry too much. 
But if you're a minority, it's, it's bloody awful. Because it's just a nod and a wink to the most violent people in society to stick the boot in. No, we've got to use these three years for something. Not just fritter it away and expecting, oh, it's Labour now, it's going to be nice. You know, this good cop, bad cop rubbish. I, I, you know, it's just driving me bonkers. We've got to use these three years. And I thought maybe that the Civil Liberties Association could actually do a full-on campaign for a, for a, a, for a human rights act. Yeah. Yeah, Look, sorry, that's, that's my rant. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a great rant, and uh, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Now is the time to uh, you know, try and get the political support across the spectrum. I think a large number of the independents who are elected to this parliament will be supportive of uh, a Human Rights Act. Um, I hope that Labor is not going to be able to ignore it as a... Um, the civil liberties uh, societies from all around the country have come together. Um, we've already sent our letter to the Attorney General with our agenda. The Human Rights Act is at the top of that agenda. There are a lot of other things on it as well. Um, but we absolutely are going to be spending uh, our time campaigning for that. Yeah, good, good. But we have no influence. <laughs> I hate to do Although, I've got to say, I have, um, we, we put a submission into the um, uh, Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet just before the election on um, Australia's digital uh, agenda. So, artific using artificial intelligence and automated decision making, highly specialised. Uh, field, but one which has got wide application, um, and you know, robo debt, of course, was the most horrible example of automated decision making and artificial intelligence uh, having appalling outcomes. Um, we put a submission in, setting out long submission, setting out civil liberties arguments for properly regulate proper regulation of those kinds of systems. And believe me now, we actually got an invitation to meet with the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet next week uh, on the submission. So um, I hope that is a signal of a, a new era. We would never have got that under the old regime. Yeah, that's good. Mm. <laughs> and I think part of that is also, you know, asking for ourselves, and I always think this about reforms and new you know, legislative progress is the question is always how will that progress be defended right if if a government then comes to power three years later that wants to repeal that act what will stop them from doing so and i think often it's collective support collective action knowing that you know if they try to legislate away say for example the eight hour work day we know you know they have hundreds of thousands of people on the streets defending that that progress that has become so enshrined in our society so it's a question of how do we actually activate more people to realize their collective power? And I mean, you know, I mentioned strikes earlier. I think this is part of the reason it's important. People need lived experience of fighting for their rights collectively. And the workplace is one of the first and best places to get it. So the recent strike wave is very, very heartening in that way. And what we need to do, I think, is to continue politicizing those moments, you know, the teachers, the nurses, university teachers, public service association, they're not desperate, you know, uh, uh, separate causes. You know, they're all influenced by a certain kind of political environment. So getting those collective movements to take the next step, to become politicized, to take on things like the MUA has done, for example, to take on social justice as a unionist issue, as an issue that is common to workers, to take on the fight for envi environmental justice as a unionist issue. Um, that gets us some of the way to knowing that when you know things like the Human Rights Act, if those do happen, that we know that we can defend those reforms against future encroachment.